So I'm trying to get some information about the need for more information. Can you give me some information about the need for more information and then give me some more of it? We've gotten these questions about how do people who live in information economy as information handlers, how do they deal with this work? How do they carry on with their chores, their tasks that they use to earn a living? And that was one thing I think, well, I know, I had a big concern about it. Because if I lost this ability, I would be unemployable. <laughs> and yeah. so it was a concern going into the final ends of this thing. Well, what if I do lose this ability to do anything? Because it is something that, you know, when you're specialized in that, that would be all you can do. Right. what you can do. It turned out not to be the case. Right. In fact, the information flows better and more freely than it ever did before. Uh, you're an experienced academician. Yeah. What would you say to that? I, I won't take any offense at that. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think it's really very interesting and counterintuitive because... Um, it's our impression that we make our living off of our thoughts, for example. So it seems like, oh, well, that's all well and good to mm -hmm. stay, to say, you know, get rid of that internal stream of thoughts. Mm -hmm. But it's those thoughts that are, you know, printing my money. So, uh, you know, and writing my books and so forth. So that's easy for you to say. Um, but that's just an impression that we have of that surface level of the selfing network that is producing those thoughts. And underneath that is where all the real action is happening. Um, one way of convincing yourself, for example, if you were a writer or you need to write copy or, you need to, or you're a designer and you need to produce in that, uh, in that domain, that to reflect upon the moments of blockage you may have had, like so writer's block or design obstacles and so forth, what it really is is that internal flow of thoughts getting in there and getting in the way and abstracting you away from what's right in front of you. I have found that uh, the more my self-referential internal narrative dwindles, the, the fewer obstacles there are to a continual flow of ideas as opposed to thoughts. And when you have that flow of ideas as opposed to thoughts, what's very interesting is you already have the best channel in town to listen in on. You don't find the need to say, okay, what's the update on the situation that's happening in France? Or what's the update that's happening, you know, in Mali? Or whatever world situation that is occurring. You just don't feel that cra craving and that need. Because that craving and that need is based on the idea of getting information from the external world that is going to somehow make you feel satisfied. As far as I can tell, you know, it's something Yogi Berra never said, but he should have, which was, you can't get there from here. You right. know, you can't get it. I think, I think also it. there's a sub rosa within this, I need to know the very latest thing that's happening in this particular crisis, oh. is this sense of somebody will ask me a question, and they'll know something I don't know about that crisis, and I'll look stupid. And so I have to be at the very cutting edge, microsecond by microsecond, so nobody can be more up to date than I am, or I'll look stupid. Gary, that perspective is itself a little bit out of date. I, <laughs> I, I'm just looking on Twitter and I see... No, I, I agree there's a kind of continual one-upsmanship by the 7 billion plus, you know, information users on the planet, of course, which are highly, you know, unequal and, and so forth. But among uh, this kind of collective information network that we've grown, there's this kind of one-upmanship game and who, who has the latest and greatest information about something. And what you find is, is that that latest and greatest information just isn't really information. It's not pertinent to your situation. It's not pertinent to the situation of events as they're unfolding. Um, so what I, I always encourage people to do, and, and, and this sounds kind of drastic, is to at least experiment with a media fast in order to see actually how little this information flow is giving you. Mm -hmm. That... You know, you, you can be with the craving, saying, oh, I really wish I knew what was going on in politics right now, right? So you can feel that craving, and then instead of actually indulging that craving, saying, no, nope, I'm on a media fast for two days, so what do I have to look at? How about I look at that craving and be with the craving? Because then what you discover is that, in fact, the going to the information source was a way of avoiding mm -hmm. the craving. 
And then by be, just being present for the craving, you make tremendous progress instead of avoiding something that was a very real obstacle to whatever your work is in terms of processing information because that means that's there all along mm -hmm. actually hindering you from focusing on the analytical situation at hand. Yeah. Another good technique, and I'm really fast is a great one, yeah. another way to implement that is, is just read a, a newspaper from two days ago uh -huh. and look at how fantastically concerned you were about these things two days ago and how it turned out the next day, it didn't matter at all. Yeah. The day after, it totally yeah. changed. There was just really no point in all this great excitement that you had. Until, oh, that's going to oh, it's going to happen. And you just look back at that. And I, we talked before about I used to be in submarines. I was under, yeah. underwater for three months at a time, and I completely missed, you know, you know two assassinations, two, two terrible things that happened in our country, with Martin Luther King and with Bobby. And you say, it didn't matter to me. I didn't know anything about it. It didn't matter that I didn't know second to second to second what was going on. I just missed the whole thing. When I came back, I got an update. Okay, that's terrible. I understand. I'm now, I'm now up to date. It's what I, I needed to be. I know, but what, what's beautiful about that teaching is, is that implicitly, when we're indulging that craving and sort of trying to stay up to date, whether it's with technical data concerning our work mm. or whether it's concerning global events like the, the, the lamentable assassinations that you mm. talked about, we have this impression that our reception of the information somehow matters to the event. <laughs> <laughs> we, right? we have to be involved it's, or it isn't happening. It's the, which is very interesting because what that is is a good intuition by us mm -hmm. as primates that in fact our consciousness is playing a role mm -hmm. in the unfolding of the world. It's just not our consciousness that is. <laughs> yeah. Consciousness is, right? And, no, and so it's really, I call it the ninth inning uh, scenario where in a baseball game, you know, your team is ahead eight to nothing or whatever, but you can't turn off the, sh the game or leave the stadium because... What if you do, and something happens. It'll, then you'll know it was your fault. <laughs> and if we, if we pause and just think about how unbelievably paranoid that right. uh, situation it's is, so and narcissistic, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, we, and we start to say, well, look, you know, uh, you know uh, I'm sure you were upset at the Robert Kennedy assassination mm -hmm. or the MLK uh, assassination, but you're not being upset except on a time delay. <laughs> didn't do anything to Robert Kennedy no, or Martin Luther King. No, made no difference to the Made no difference to the event. Made, and so engaging that experiment of the newspaper two days, two days old yeah. or, uh, and uh, going to a media fast and seeing like, okay, I'm just going to do maybe just the afternoon. I won't look at anything. Exactly. Then, you know, it's just, so much of it now so fast. Yeah, and just say, oh, I'm not going to get any updates. And then you'll realize that it's very much like the old soap operas mm -hmm. where you could stop watching for two years yeah. Tune back in and say, oh, there's been another coma, but look, <laughs> it's all. still the same people. Yeah. And, and you start, well, the, the benefit of it is that rather than being lost in the details of the moment by moment unfolding, mm -hmm. you actually see the big patterns. Yeah. And you see that while the particular way some particular event has unfolded, that the fact of it unfolding is not surprising at all because it's part of a much larger scale pattern that if you're not caught up in the details of the constant stream is obvious and you won't react to it in the same way and in a way it's even in the kind of situation of mourning and tragedy as you were discussing it's you know more authentic almost in the sense that you allow it to be a tragedy mm -hmm. as opposed to this someone has to be blamed I've got to do something about this We've got to change this. Well, you know, how's that working out for us? Exactly. exactly. Well, a little, this a little pragmatic thing is people say, well, can I possibly, or can I read to myself as mm. I read? Yeah. Or is that, is that violating the no thoughts thing? It really, no, it's a whole different kind of it's class. Totally different. You yeah. can feel the energy behind what I'm reading to myself. Mm -hmm. And when you're getting into one of these hyper emotional, oh, yeah. cyclonic events, you just feel the difference. The brain can parse those out. And so if you're concerned about that, just, just watch. You can watch how it transitions from just reading. If it moves over into emotionally charged stuff, you can watch, you can watch it happen. And just keep over here and then the non-emotionally charged stuff, absolutely read to yourself. You need to do. Indeed, I would say that you actually can't read properly without silencing that internal stream mm -hmm. of thoughts mm -hmm. because all you're doing otherwise 
is projecting that wonderfully named cyclonic uh, emotional event that you are at that point on to whatever is in front exactly. of you in the text. You're not seeing what's really there. I've observed this in 21 years of teaching literature and philosophy that people cannot read, very bright people, cannot read a single sentence until they've let go of what they think the sentence already says. And so um, it's a very distinct mode of uh, cognition in my experience. And very good training can be to read something that you care about and while you're reading it, note its effects on you. Mm -hmm. It's going to sound like it's difficult or hard. It's not difficult. Mm -hmm. You've got a parallel processor up here. You read the words and then you learn to register the effect of those words on you. And what you do is you feel what is the emotional and cognitive response that I'm having to those words mm -hmm. even while you read the words. And that actually is a much deeper mode of reading because then you're not only reading for what the words say, but how they say it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yes, I mean, I think this is a boon for knowledge workers. Uh, mm -hmm. There's been at least one recent uh, computer, pro computer programming manual, development manual, that has a chapter on meditation mm -hmm. as a practice that developers should use. Mm -hmm. Because, again, if anybody needs to be able to see symbol by symbol, line by line, what the code says, rather than what you expect it to say, right. that would be somebody, you know, as a developer, right. a programmer, and getting to a zero state of right. cognition gives you a more lucid grasp of that.